Hello, I'm Luca Torex, and welcome to my Hungary Faction Guide for Medieval 2 Total War. Today I'll be discussing the faction of Hungary, its units, its campaign strategy, its position on the campaign map. Just a sort of quick summary of this very, I think it's quite an interesting faction in fact. Other people may not agree with me, but I, I quite like Hungary I would say. It's a Catholic faction, which is something you have to take into consideration, especially when you consider where, where and who you want to expand against. So yeah, Hungary is indeed Catholic. The campaign rules on the long, anyway, which is what I always play on, is to hold 45 regions, including the Jerusalem region. That's what you've got to do to win the long campaign, which is relatively standard, I would say, particularly for a Catholic faction. As it says over on the right, its strengths are, it boasts a strong mix of heavy knights and skilled horse archers, which is quite cool, but its weaknesses are it lacks good offensive infantry, which... I, I kind of think it's a bit of a it's a bit of a contradiction there because it says good heavy knights but then it says lacks good infantry but oh, whatever what do I know I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation for that anyway so yeah Hungary very interesting faction as far as I'm concerned first of all we're going to be having a look at the units and then we'll discuss campaign strategy okay so on the right are the units of the faction of Hungary as you can see and we'll start off with the peasants and traditionally on all total war games the peasants are pretty trash well certainly for the earlier ones i'm not so uh, current up with the newer ones but on medieval 2 total war anyway as it says they're really only good for cannon fodder you know only use them if you're really desperate or you need to garrison the city which is never going to be attacked but at attack of four defense of three with poor morale means these guys cannot stand up to much at all which is fairly obvious because they're peasants so town militia again another standard unit these guys are a step up from peasants, but honestly not a huge step up. I have discussed town militia quite a few times before. A defensive unit, really their job is to guard towns, hence the name really. Attack of five, defense of four, but at least they haven't got that poor morale, unlike the peasants. Next up, Slav levies. Comprised of commoners from the lower strata of society. Yeah, These levy troops are armed with spears and little armour. 5 attack, 7 defence, so same attack rating, slightly higher defence than the town militia, which means they're a, you know, a pretty decent um, defensive unit for the early, early game. They're armed with spears, which is, means they're of course a more defensive unit, and the fact they have a little bit of armour suggests that as well. So yeah, I mean Slav levies, particularly holding a town or maybe holding a line against some basic troops, yeah they could do a solid job, and they look nice and cheap as well, which is good. Croat Axemen, another early period unit, and these guys are pretty cool, if I do say so. I'm not normally a huge fan of Axemen in Total War games, that's personal preference, but an attack of 15, defense of 7, charge bonus of 5, and effective against armor in the early period, that is pretty cool indeed. So these Croat Axemen do look quite good. They're accustomed to fighting in their rugged native terrain. Yeah, I quite like these guys, they actually look pretty good. Next up, Transylvanian Peasants. Now, what about these guys? These sound cool. Fierce peasant volunteers from Eastern Europe, armed with halberds that can pull a man off a horse. So these are, I mean, they are still peasants, so they're not going to be good. But they're peasants who are willing to fight, unlike farmers who have just been dragged away from their home to fight some foreign war in Turkey or whatever. These guys want to fight and they want to kill some people, and that's something I can respect in this time period anyway. So the attack of five is okay at best, really isn't that okay. And the defense of one is atrocious, but hey, they like to fight, they're enjoying themselves, so, you know, they can have fun doing that, I suppose. Not the greatest unit ever though. Next up, Spear Militia, a relatively common unit, I would say. A defensive unit, hence the Spearman name. So that means they're good for holding a line and good for holding towns, in the early game anyway, particularly. Attack of 5 is slightly underwhelming, but they are spearmen, as I said, a defensive unit. Defense of 7 is okay, but it's really the fact they're armed with long spears, which is good. They cannot they cannot form a skilltrum, which I quite like my skilltrum, I quite like my defensive formations in spear troops, so that's a bit of a shame indeed. Next up, so this is late, late period stuff. Battlefield Assassins. Now, tracing their history to an obscure order of knights, these battlefield assassins are masters of stealth and death. It sounds like something that should be on Assassin's Creed or something, like the Templars versus the knights, but it's not. It's on Medieval 2 Total War. 
Attack of 16, very good. Defense of 16, very good. And two hit points. They can hide anywhere. Combat bonus in woods or snow. Good morale, very good stamina. Now, I say this, it seems like almost every time. But I compare these kinds of... But I compare these types of troops to the Arcani of Rome Total War. If you've played Rome Total War, you kind of know what I mean if you've played as the Romans. And I say this every time, so this is a slight repetition. But Arcani are troops that on paper look brilliant. And when used well in good situations can be brilliant. But in a day-to-day, -day, everyday battle... Honestly, they will be quite underwhelming. And there's one single reason for that, and that is the amount of men in the unit. And you can see here, the standard size is 60 or 75. These guys are only 30. And it means they won't make a huge impact across the whole battle. You know, if only a few of them go out, you're down to 75, 50% of the unit left. But the good round means they shouldn't break, however. I just don't find units with small amount of troops in that useful. And they're just... Although they sound brilliant, I just never seem to use them. And it's kind of similar to the Battlefield Assassins. They remind me of the Arcani, and that's why I personally stay away from them. But it doesn't mean you, that they can not be used in a certain situation. Certain situations when you really need to have a shock troop or something that can just deal a good amount of damage against inferior troops in a short amount of time cause a route, cause a mass route, cause a break, then yes, yeah, sure, Battlefield Assassins look really, really cool. They are a cool unit, but the reason they only have 30 men in the unit is because they'd be ridiculously overpowered if they didn't, and, well, they don't, so they're not ridiculously overpowered, even though they might look like it on paper, purely by looking at the stats. Halberd Militia. And this is an interesting uh, unit. Militia units armed with a halberd, which we've seen before, which can fend off cavalry and pierce or crush armour. Attack of 5, a bit underwhelming. Defence of 1, very underwhelming. They can form a spear wall, which is quite cool. It's a nice sort of defensive formation. Effective against armour. Combat bonus in woods or snow. Vulnerable to missiles. Very long spears. So it's, uh, this is kind of like an oxymoron. It's a, they're a defensive unit, but also because they, they've got like long spears and etc. But they only have a defence of 1. But they can form a spear wall, which means they're positive. So it's very, very mysterious unit, honestly. I don't really think I would find many situations where I would use these guys purely because their defense is low. But if you do want a unit with long spears, maybe to hold a gate or something like that, then I see, see how these guys could be useful. But honestly, I don't rate them too much. Next up, Pathis Spearmen. Lower gentry serving military duty, wearing good armors, armor and equipped with a spear, able to form a defensive ring of spears. These guys are a step up, but of course, they're late unit troops, so you'd expect them to be a step up for sure. Attack of 7, which is good for a defensive unit, comparatively especially to the earlier militia units, which we've already looked at, which have an attack of 4 or 5. Defense of 14, again, very big step up. And I mentioned the skill trim earlier, defensive formation, similar to the phalanx, if you played Rome Total War like I have a lot. The skill trim means that they are more compact and they're harder to actually penetrate the line, which means they're better in defense as well. So a good unit, bonus fighting cavalry, which is natural of most good spearmen, which these guys are. They are good spearmen, but obviously they're very late game spearmen. You know, you're going to have to get your tech up and go through the terrible militia units before you get to these guys. But yeah, I quite like them. I quite like them indeed. Early period, dismounted feudal knights are up next. More expensive, you can see the cost difference between, you know, even like these troops which are down the 300s, 200s to dismounted feudal knights. And something I didn't mention earlier is, you know, for example, the battlefield assassins, there's 13 a unit, 660 florins. When you can get 75, so that's over double, if you can't do maths, over double for a lot, lot cheaper, for like half the price. So... I'm just saying value for money, I don't rate these guys. But anyway, we're, we're talking about dismantled feudal knights. So they're expensive, which knights are, but as the game said at the beginning, their knights are good. Knights would often dismount and fight on foot when the situation demanded it. Dismounted, they make excellent heavy infantry. So, yeah, as I say, it's a bit of a sort of oxymoron from the beginning because the game said, oh, well, it hasn't got very good heavy infantry. Well, this is an example of very good heavy infantry in the early period as well. Attack of 13, defense of 21, charge bonus of 3, good morale, well armoured and good stamina. It's all evidence of this being a good unit. 
I suppose the bad thing about them is they're more expensive than militia units, but that's natural. They're knights. They're going to be more expensive. They are better armoured. You get what you pay for at the end of the day. These guys for an offensive unit are very, very good indeed. Yeah, I quite like my feudal knights. Who doesn't? Dismounted chivalric knights. Basically, they're pretty awesome. High period, elite heavy infantry, influenced by western techniques. Well armoured and well trained, but can act rashly. Attack of 13, defense of 19, charge bones of 3. All the same kind of stuff with the good morale and the well armoured. But they can act rashly, which means they won't do their told. And this is something which I hate. Um, personally, I hate. I like having complete control of all of my units. I'm playing as Germania in a series at the moment. And sometimes the troops just go off and they do their own thing. And they just charge a unit when I didn't tell them to. I like, personally, good organised armies where they everyone just does what they're told. But I suppose if you're playing Medieval 2 Total War and you want an organised army which does what they're told, Hungary probably isn't the first faction you're going to choose anyway. If you want Hungary, you want some troops that are not afraid to knuckle down and get involved with some good old fighting. Good old fashioned fighting is what I like. Uh, and this is more this kind of troop. And they'll just charge, but they'll kill some men along the way. So who cares? I suppose. Peasant archers, so now we're on to the archers, and you've probably seen peasant archers before, I have talked about them before. They are peasants with a bow, basically. They are, have very, very terrible melee attack, but that's not what they're useful for. A missile attack of 5 is, of course, underwhelming, but to be honest, in the early, early game, they're cheap, nice missile, I like missile troops. I would actually say, you know what, I quite like peasant archers, I'd get a few of them myself. You get them up on the wall, you get them up on the high ground advantage, they'll do a solid job indeed. Next up, Bosnian archers. This is interesting. So exactly the same missile attack, but the difference is they are better in the melee. And I never really know what to think about this. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a blessing and it's kind of not. In the sense that, yes, okay, it's a blessing that you can now fight in the melee with archers. Cool. But are you ever really going to do it? I don't know. I still think it's better, obviously, to have a melee archer, an archer that's just capable with actually using a dagger or a sword, so it is cool, but it's just something I find, you know, if I see a unit and it says, oh, it's got really good melee attack and it's an archer, I think, oh, that's awesome, it's really, really good, but actually I never end up fighting in the melee with them, so I don't know, but I suppose it means you don't have to protect them as much with the front line, and it doesn't matter if somebody penetrates the front line because actually the Bosnian archers will be able to stand up a little bit more than the peasant archer alternative. So, late period, we're into the era of crossbowmen now. Attack of 6, defense of 8, missile attack of 9. You would hope they have a better missile attack. It's a crossbow instead of an, a bow, or whatever it's called. And it means they're effective against armor, because that's what crossbowmen are, basically. I've discussed crossbowmen in my other um, faction guides in more detail, if you want me to talk about them. They're all pretty much the same for every faction, as far as I'm aware. Ah, uh, these guys. And the reason I don't like these guys, not because they are bad, because they're not bad, it's because I can't pronounce their name. Arca... Y you can read. You can read. I can't read, evidently. But these guys, you can see uh, on the screen who I'm pointing to, decent in the melee, they'll be able to hold up for a little bit, but their missile attack of 14 is very, very good. Big step up from the normal crossbowmen, huge step up from the archers. So... Obviously, these are late period troops, so you'd hope that they could do that. Effective against armor, which is important. If you don't have archers or crossbowmen that aren't effective against armor, they're basically useless in the late period because the other factions are going to have knights and cavalry and all that, you know, stuck with armor all over them, big metal plates and whatever, and they're not going to be able to penetrate that. If you can't penetrate that, you're going to have a problem. So these guys do a good job for sure. But yeah, can't pronounce their name, so I apologize for that in advance. Pavese Crossbow Militia. Now, Crossbow Militia, as you can see, so this is, again, it's a very, very interesting fact. Missile attack is very, very good, like the previous lads, and they're very good in the melee. They'll be able to stand up, and 14 defense is very, very good for an archer. Long-range missiles is a big bonus as far as I'm concerned. That's a major bonus, to be honest. But yeah, these guys can hold up. Very similar to my comments about the earlier missile troop, which could actually hold up in the melee. It, they're cool. I, I do quite like them indeed. So yeah, 12 missile attack is good. Good melee attack and defense is useful, I suppose. Let's get on to the cavalry. The I apologize, I'm not Hungarian. I do not know how to pronounce some of these names, but I'm going to give it a stab. 
Hussars. These guys are renowned for their fast hit and run tactics. They are equipped with light mail, shield, lance and sword. Late period cavalry as you can see from the top. Attack of 13 and defense of 15 is very very solid for cavalry indeed. This is kind of, I mean I, I was sort of reading up on it, it's a kind of a more eastern style faction. So, you know, this is kind of evidence that their cavalry is pretty good indeed. Good morale, yeah, very, very solid cavalry for sure. But it is late period, so it's going to take a while to build up these guys. Merchant Cavalry Militia. So they're well armoured, and that is evidenced by their defence of 14. But a poorly trained, well equipped cavalry who fight with a sword. It's kind of a bit of a mix of good and bad. Basically, long story short, they're not very good in attack, but they're good in defence. So, honestly, I don't know how useful it is for cavalry, because the thing is, cavalry are not a defensive unit. You're never in a battle going to think, right, we need to defend this area of land, so we're going to have a line of cavalry that just sit there and defend it. Ne nobody ever does that. Nobody. Cavalry are an offensive unit, and for cavalry that specialise in defence, it kind of just seems a little bit pointless, to me anyway. It seems a little bit pointless. I like my offensive cavalry, even though I'm more of an infantry man myself. Unless they're horse archers, of course, in which case I love them. Feudal Knights. Now we're getting into some early period cavalry, which is good. Weird order it's done this in, but there we go, it's not my fault. And for early cavalry, these guys are good. An attack of 10 is very solid indeed. Defense of 16 is very, very good indeed. It's a heavy armor. Now, heavy armor is good. It's a blessing in the sense that they're not going to die. And troops dying generally isn't a good thing in a battle if you're the one that's dying. However, the fact that they are well armored and blah, blah, blah means they are quite slow. It says they can ride down their opponents, but I doubt that. Heavy armored troops... It, they're not, they don't strike me as light infantry to me, but maybe somebody can correct me on that one. But yeah, good, good cavalry. Really, they can pack a punch, and they can fight for a decent amount of time, and they will stand up because they've got that good morale. The may charge their orders I discussed earlier isn't something I particularly like, but for some people, that might be pretty cool, who knows. Royal Bandarium, probably saying that wrong, but there we go. Armed with lances encased in plate armour, these loyal warriors act as a retinues and bodyguard for royalty. It's pretty cool indeed. 13 attack is very, very good for cavalry. 16 defense. Good morale, powerful charge, well armored, very good stamina. These guys are going to cause some damage. Plus that charge bonus of 8. Charge bonus, of course, being very, very important for cavalry in particular. And yeah, these guys are pretty good because of it. But again, late cavalry, so in the early game, you're not going to get access to these guys anyway. The bodyguards, so we have the early bodyguard, the early bodyguard are good, the early bodyguard are basically as good as these guys, not quite, because they haven't got the um, very good morale, I think. Oh no, these guys only got good morale as well, so, you know, I mean, they haven't, they're very, very similar, basically. Very similar, but obviously there's less actual horses in a unit, which I've discussed already, unless it is the faction leader, in which case it'll have, like, double the amount. Still, the fact that you can get access to this quality of cavalry early on, even if they are bodyguard, is pretty cool. But then they are bodyguards, everyone's bodyguard is going to be good. It kind of negates it. You know what I'm saying. But yeah, general's bodyguard. And then you have the late period general's bodyguard. Naturally, they are better. Not a huge amount better, to be honest. Bit better on the old defense. They got a powerful charge and very good stamina. These are elite knights. They're better armoured, these guys. You can see from the picture alone, they're better armoured. And that's what them, they'll make them stand up a little bit more, for sure. Next up, chivalric knights. Late, late period cavalry. Elite cavalry, influenced by Western techniques. You can see in the late game, the Hungarians are getting influenced more by the West than the East. Which I suppose is natural because they're more influenced by the East in the early game. Attack of 13, defense of 16, as I've already discussed. It's very, very good. Very, very similar to the rest of the cavalry um, that I've discussed in the late period. Good, solid cavalry indeed. Okay, Knights Templar. We are getting into some elite stuff. Elite, there you go. And sometimes reckless knights formed to protect Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. And in this game, if a unit is fighting for their religion, they are going to fight for a while. And they're going to fight with fury. And that's what these guys do. But they may charge out orders, which is kind of a commonality you're noting at this point. I've already mentioned that before. Good morale, powerful charge, well-armoured, good stamina. These guys are fighting for their faith, and they'll do a damn good job in the process. Knights Hospitalier. 
probably saying that wrong as well. Um, the deadliest heavy cavalry in all of Christendom. It pronounces these guys, which is quite the uh, yeah, quite the compliment indeed. 13 and 16 as a combination seems to be quite a commonality as well. Good morale, powerful charge. I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit. These guys are good. Elite, elite stuff. Now we're getting onto the units I like. Horse archers. I like my horse archers in every game. We have Magyar. I hope I'm saying that right. I don't even know where Magyar is. Magyar Cavalry. These natural horsemen are armoured with composite bow and wear light armour. Actually all right in the melee. Not as good obviously as these guys over here. But 6 and 7 for Missile Cavalry. That's actually not too bad. They can hold themselves for a couple of seconds. Missile Attack of 6 is better than the early game Archers. These guys can do a solid job. I'm a big, big fan of horse archers you can you know that from my Scythia campaign on Rome Total War if you've seen that horse archers can be seriously overpowered and uh, yeah doesn't really matter what missile attack they've got they're good and then Hungarian nobles now these are early game troops as it says here a lot more expensive but look at some of these stats 9 attack 16 defense is good for normal cavalry never mind missile cavalry so Hungarian nobles are pretty cool Indeed, they are very capable in close combat, and their missile attack has improved. Good morale, good stamina, these guys are really quite good horse archers, I do like them a lot. Now next up, you can see here we're getting onto the siege equipment, the cannons, the ballista, all of that. I discussed that in my very first faction guide, it was England, the England faction guide, so if you want to have a look at these lads, you can ask a question in the comments or whatever, but... I would recommend looking at my England faction guide. I go over these a lot more, a lot more detail. And there we go. That is all we've got. They are all the Hungarian units as far as I can see. So, yeah, as I say, any questions about these guys, you can uh, ask me indeed. So what we're going to do now, we're going to have a look at the little introduction video that you get before you play as Hungary. And then I'll talk about campaign strategy. of Hungary was forged by the will of King Saint Stephen. Foreign incursions rally its people, who are determined that the country follow its own path. Kingdom founded by greatness requires the strength and will few possess to lead it to glory. An empire awaits one strong enough to carve it. Okay, so this is the starting position for Hungary. Let's get it in the center there. And as you can see, it's only two settlements at the beginning, Budapest and Bran. So the Hungarian capital is Budapest, and you have a Hungarian castle over here. Two settlements in the middle of Europe, which means basically you can expand in any direction, theoretically. I mean, you know, some factions you get less choice about, others you do. So for example, you know, I mean, you know, factions over here like the Moors, well, you're not going to expand this way because it's black and there's nothing there. In this point in the game anyway. So the interesting thing about factions I find in this kind of position is yeah there's, you can go any way you want but some directions are more optimal than others and I'll discuss that right now but to do so I'm going to turn off the fog of war as I discuss in every faction guide I don't actually play with the fog of war off I consider it cheating personally but just so I can show you what's going on around so you can actually see rather than just be a shadowy mess yeah I'll turn off the fog of war for you. There we go. So we can see what's going on now, which is very good indeed. We have the Holy Roman Empire over here, Vienna and um, Nuremberg and all that. We have Poland to the north, Krakow and Halic. We have rebel territory basically all over here, which is, yeah, cool. And then the Byzantines, I call them Byzantines, sorry if you call them Byzantines. The Byzantine Empire over here to the south. 
and then the Venetians over in this direction. So quite a few factions around, and the Seljuks are sort of lingering nearby as well. There's quite a few factions, quite a few ways to expand. So where do you go? Well, there's... because it, It's very interesting because obviously Hungary are Catholic and they're surrounded by Catholic factions, apart from the Byzantines and the Seljuks. So that kind of indicates where you've got to expand. Anyway... What you want to do is get Zagreb as quickly as you can. You've got to beat the Venetians to it. Now, the AI normally isn't that quick off the mark. They normally aren't that quick off the mark. Not as quick as a human would be. But there is a Venetian right here who could get to Zagreb within a turn. Councillor Bartim... Bartolomeo, whatever his face is. There's a Venetian nearby. And your army, your closest army of Captain Giza, he's going to take two turns to get over. But I still think you should get over to Zagreb in time. Now, I would probably move a few more troops out of Budapest. I'd probably take um, a spear militia and maybe a... Hmm, I'd probably take a peasant archer along as well over here, like that. And then I'd probably bring the guys over to Zagreb. It'll take a couple of turns. But you'll get there before Vienna, hopefully. Vienna? Venetia. Venetia, sorry. I can see that um, Vienna's there. I, before Venice. If not, if you can't beat them in two turns, then don't bring those extra units, that's my opinion. Inside of Zagreb, you can see there's only four units, so you don't have to bring a huge amount of force, uh, indeed. So why do you want to go for Zagreb straight away? Well, as I mentioned, Hungary is Catholic, which means you can't go around attacking Catholic factions because the Pope's going to get annoyed. You could, but if you don't want to annoy the Pope, then it's not a good way to go around. So if you go straight for Vienna, he's going to be like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And Poland and so on and so forth. If you take Zagreb, first of all, if the if, if the Venice people, Venetians is the word for that, if the Venetians take Zagreb and you attack it, well, the Pope's going to get annoyed, so you might as well beat them to it. But secondly, it can actually be a good way of baiting factions into attacking you, and this is quite a good tactic. If you're a Catholic faction, you want to bait other Catholic factions into attacking you, if that's what you want to do. Because if they attack you and you attack them back, and take a settlement, the Pope hasn't got really that reason to be mad, unless you go overboard and take like five settlements and kill their leader and all that. If you if you attack then the Venetian army after that, well, he'll be like, well, they attacked you first. That is generally the case, not always, generally the case. So if you take Zagreb and they want Zagreb, which they probably will because they haven't got very many ways to expand, then you have a good pretense to go to war against them legitimately and means you can potentially take Venice or Ragusa. For example, I'd probably go for a Goozer actually because reasons. But you can go for either. It's a good it's a good way for getting a pretense to go to war Venetia, uh, Venetia early on. Basically, is my opinion. So this army moved towards Zagreb. Now you have, well, you have Bucharest right here. You have a Yassi over here. I wouldn't go as far as Kiev personally. Personally, wouldn't go as far as Kiev. I'd let the Poles and the Russians fight over that. That's my opinion. You have rebel territory over here. You want to beat the Byzantines to it. If you start going for rebel territory up here, then first of all, you're going to draw Poland into war probably, which you don't want to do. You might as well let them fight out against the Danish and the Russians and the Holy Roman Empire. You don't want too many enemies early on. It's the danger of being in the middle of the map. You don't want too many enemies early on. So you might go for a Yassi. I think that's probably a good idea. Wouldn't go as far as Kiev. Kaffa, maybe. Kaffa, maybe I'd go for. But my priority, though, would be for Bucharest, because it's right there. It's right there. So get this, I'd get this force. I know it's a little bit north, but I'd get towards Bucharest, personally. Personally, I'd get towards Bucharest, and I'd try and get Sofia before before the Byzantines get there. That's my opinion. You don't want the Byzantines to expand too much, and yeah, they, are, they are a faction you're going to go for early on, in my opinion. So what I would do, long-term strategy, I would go for the Byzantines. They are quite strong in the early game. They've got a lot of money. They've got Constantinople, which is the biggest city in the whole game, as far as I know. But that's just a good reason to take them out as quickly as possible. Settlements like Thessalonica aren't well defended. Corinth isn't. They're, un they're undefended and they're very, very profitable. Take control of Greece. Take control of the Mediterranean. So you can take control of this area by getting under a pretense of war against Venice. I poss possibly wouldn't go for the capital just because it's too close to other factions and so on and so forth. You could then go for Ragusa and the Pope shouldn't mind too much if they attack Zagreb first. So that's how I deal with the Venetians. And then you have this portion of the of the land. I think it's Monday Croatia sorted out. Then further down, well, you have this army. He can sweep through Bucharest, Sofia. 
I wouldn't go for Constantinople. You could. It's quite strong. You could go for Constantinople, actually. But I'd possibly go for Thessalonica and Corinth first because they're less well defended. And Durazzo. And then build up a big force and then go for, towards Constantinople. At which point, this whole region you can control. And if you have control of the Monday Greece and they're sort of dealing with the Venetians very well, you're fine. You're set for the campaign. You're set for the campaign indeed. So that's sort of my general advice. There isn't a huge amount more. I'd go for the Byzantines and the Venetians first. I wouldn't go for the Poles or the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire are quite strong in the early game, even though they are surrounded by a lot of factions as well. But I personally wouldn't go in that direction. I just wouldn't. I think that places along the coast, along the Mediterranean, are a lot more profitable than places like Breslau and Thorn, which are probably going to go to Poland anyway, and you don't want to be in a massive war with about five or six factions. I'd probably get an alliance with Poland. That's what I'd probably do. The problem with that is, if they go to war with the Holy Roman Empire, you don't want them at your doorstep either. So you've got to think carefully before you do that. But you could potentially go for that. That's sort of my general advice for Hungary. And that's it, really. An, in an interesting faction. Very interesting faction as far as I'm concerned, because you can expand in any direction. They have a nice mix of cavalry and infantry, the knights are good, the spearmen are a little bit off, but then if you want to have spearmen, you're going to be as Milan or Venice or um, Sicily or something like that, you're not going to be hungry, so, you know, that's fine. Yeah, it's a very interesting faction, my general advice is expand this direction as opposed to this direction, which is a common thing really, I'd say don't really bother expanding into this direction, Kaffir at some point you could probably take. But I wouldn't go as far as Kiev, as I said already. So that's basically it. I'll be back with more faction guides very, very soon. If you want to request a faction guide for me to do next, I'm planning on doing France next. But if someone says, oh, please, I'm doing a, I don't know, a soldier. Oh, I've done soldier Turks, bad example. I'm doing a campaign of the Moors and they have no idea what to do. Can you do a faction guide on the Moors? And I'll say, yeah, of course, I'll do that next. Otherwise, I'll be back with more videos. Hopefully soon. It is exam period at the moment, which means I'm incredibly, incredibly busy. But I'm trying to get as many videos out as I can possibly. So thank you very much for watching. I'll see you around.